It's 1907. You manufacture horse harnesses, bridles, and some of the parts that connect horses to carriages. Business is doing fine, but that automobile is starting to gain public interest. What do you do? If you're like most business owners, you keep doing what you've been doing. You manufacture your horse and carriage related equipment. After all, your dad owned this business before you and it's always been very lucrative. What could go wrong? Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. As my little historical example indicates, those with a vested interest in the past way of doing things are, well, very likely to continue to do things the way they've always been done. I believe there are two main reasons for this behavior. One is obvious, one a little bit less so. The obvious is the financial aspect. If you've made a business based on a traditional model that does very well financially, you're currently making money and you're paying your employees and you're making a good profit and a good living off of it. It's therefore really hard to consider moving to another model or making another product that could potentially make very little or even nothing, and of course you could piss off your current customers too. Not only does it risk your livelihood, but that of your employees as well. The second reason is a psychological one. If you're entrenched in one paradigm, you simply can't think outside of that paradigm. Thomas Kuhn, in his seminal book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, discusses how paradigm shifts in science work Interestingly enough, they follow an S-curve just like technology adoption, which you can see my video about up here. And that's not a mistake or a coincidence. Just like radically new science, adoption of radically new technology requires a mental like reset button. There are, of course, very early adopters or new paradigm thinkers. These people can often see a future that's not like today in some fundamental way. They've been laughed at, scoffed, or even thrown in jail like Galileo, or worse. I'm sure some people have been burned at the stake for it. But she's a witch! <laughs> but over time, these people's ideas are proven right. Whether that's scientific evidence that their theory is correct, or price, convenience, safety, engineering reasons that a particular technology is proven better than the old system. And thus we get to the end of the bottom of the S-curve, and some of the more cautious people decide to take a look into this new way of looking at the world, or try purchasing a new technology product. Both of these require something very important, a person's time, or alternatively a person's money, which is simply a barter system for time. With more and more people investing time and money and discovering that this hypothesis or this technology is in fact better, we reach the S-curve tipping point at the bottom where it starts to really take off, and suddenly we're at a strong linear growth rate. And before long, most people either believe this new scientific paradigm or have moved to this new technology. But who's left behind at the end of this S-curve, the very top part? Well, those who are very, very cautious, of course, but more importantly for this discussion, those who have a strong vested interest in the old way of thinking or making. Consider a fully Newtonian scientist in the early 20th century. This person has a great career based on figuring out weird, complex equations to explain the orbit of Mercury, almost, and he or she is going to be highly resistant to Einstein's general relativity theory. It breaks his or her entire career and makes the work of a lifetime meaningless. Or alternatively, take that horse leather manufacturer. He is going to at first scoff at, then get threatened by the newfangled gas-powered autos. Only at the end, when it's too late for him to really pivot anymore, will he realize that he should have bitten the bullet years ago and switched to making leather seats for cars or something like that. And of course, a few legacy companies will be forward thinking and risk taking enough to do this, but most won't, and almost none of them will be the company that actually drives the paradigm shift. Think about Tesla. They could see an electric, battery-operated future as a real possibility based on current, early 2000s technology. And they could see that electric cars could, or actually should, be based around computers, and that autonomous driving was in the future. Again, based on early 2000s technology and how rapidly it was evolving. And, just as importantly, they had no stake in the internal combustion engine or ICE car game. If, say, GM had bought Tesla in 2008, there would be no mass market electric car still, because GM would have absorbed the technology and waited until later to make more than a token few concept cars. Because, as has happened, battery electric vehicles are a massive threat to the company and their internal combustion engine cars, and their service centers, and their dealerships, and their profit centers. 
These companies have, or at least had, a massive stake in keeping things the same for as long as possible. After all, it worked great yesterday, why not tomorrow too? But of course history would show them that tomorrow disappeared for the horse-based economy and was handed to the auto-based economy. So of course it could happen again. Let's talk about SpaceX in just a moment, but first, if you enjoy this video, definitely like it so other people can find it, because that's how YouTube works. And also like it because if we get to 10,000 subscribers before the new year, and we're really, really close to that, I'm going to give away a special little present to some lucky subscriber. Also, a big shout out to my Patreon patrons. Thank you all so much. If you're interested in joining, definitely look at the link in the description for more about that. And a big new patron shout out to Jonathan Drake. Thank you so much. Also, as always, a big thank you to Zenly Music for doing the intro and conclusion music. He's a wonderful artist. You should definitely check him out on Instagram or YouTube. And finally, if you're in the market for a new Tesla, definitely check out our referral link. If you use it and buy a car, we both get a thousand free supercharger miles, which is awesome. Okay, now let's think about SpaceX. They could see a future where private companies could not only compete, but beat bloated government contractors at getting to space. And of course, get to Mars as well. That's in the plan. What were most of these companies doing at the time? What worked yesterday? And why not? For decades, governments around the world poured money into space, mostly due to scare tactics about space defense, but that's a whole other subject entirely. <laughs> so, of course, why wouldn't this work tomorrow as well? Companies like ULA were so above even competing with tiny players like SpaceX that they didn't even enter NASA's private funding competition in the late 2000s. By the way, this is all in Christian Davenport's wonderful book about Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson, and the rise of the private space race. Super cool book, you should read it. First, of course, these large companies thought no private group could get to orbit. That was simply too big an engineering challenge. And SpaceX was literally laughed off stage at times. When SpaceX did get there, they thought, well, certainly they can't do it reliably, but then they did. And then, of course, these big companies thought, well, certainly no one can do it cheaper, but then SpaceX started to actually land their rockets and reuse them. And now SpaceX has a full manifest of flights, including human-rated ones, while Boeing and ULA and the like are struggling for customers and still can't fly humans to space. The private company selling rides to space and reusing rockets paradigm had been discussed in fiction for decades, you know, well before the first spacecraft even went into space. But the cost plus governmental contract method paradigm had been established in the 1960s, at least in the US, and it made a lot of companies rich. So why on earth, haha, <laughs> get it, <laughs> would they change? So again, looking at the big picture, look at traditional automakers. They are struggling to remain relevant. Some, like Volkswagen, at least if D stays in charge of it, might have a chance, but most will not. And a large number of them will go bankrupt and sooner than people imagine possible. Without government bailouts, there might only be three or four car companies based out of the US by 2030. And half or more of them will be EV startups, not traditional companies like GM. And also look at space. Governmental programs like Artemis are struggling to justify their costs, and customers are flocking to the much cheaper SpaceX launches, and of course Rocket Lab as well. Those guys are awesome. And we are even looking at a future not too far away when building-sized ships will rise into space, come back down, and be fully reusable. And there's even a possible future where humans are on Mars. However, as a counterexample, see my video on space exploration here. And so in 10 years or so, private companies will likely have the lion's share of space transport, not government-backed entities, but private companies that sell rides to space. So just these two examples clearly show how disruption almost always has to come from the outside. Outsiders can see possible futures much more clearly than those buried in the way that things have been. Outsiders also have no stake in the way things are now, and there are a lot more potential upstarts out there than there are established players in any industry. It just takes one person like Elon Musk or one company to disrupt the cushy nature of business for an entire industry. As a famous line states, the only constant is change. And everyone who firmly believes that because things have always worked that way for an industry means it always will are flat out demonstrably wrong. So what do you do? Think like a startup company. Always. Never get comfortable. Never get too invested in the way things have worked. Always keep an eye out for disruption in the future and risk it all to be that disruption. Otherwise, somebody else is going to do it for you and you'll be left behind.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that video and found it informative and interesting to think about. If you did, definitely make sure you like and subscribe. And also definitely make sure you ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>